Jason Vandeboom, how's it going? Doing well. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks again for carving out some time for us. I know you're super busy, man, over there at Active Campaign. Um, I'm excited. We have some listeners that I've talked to that are excited about having you on. Uh, but let's let's go ahead and jump in. Um, you know, Active Campaign is uh, relatively well known in the Chicago tech ecosystem. Um, I've been following your work and your company for some time. But just for the listeners that uh, maybe aren't familiar with Active Campaign, why don't you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, Active Campaign is a customer experience automation platform. What that means is we really just help brands uh, find, connect with, engage uh, with prospects, with their customers, really through the entire customer lifecycle. Uh, so really, how do you not only just get a sale or, or work on your marketing, but like turn customers into advocates, help you grow your business, help you save your time. Very cool. Very cool. And then t- uh, stats to date that you're willing to share, how, how many employees or how many countries or states or cities yeah, is no, active campaign? Uh, it, it's been an interesting sort of background. Started the company back in 2003. Fast forward to 2016, we started off the year at about 20 or so people. Uh, and then fast forward to today and we're uh, north of 700 people. Uh, so different phases, um, <laughs> but all all enjoyable, all delightful in their own way, right? Like, and um, And then in terms of like building the business, a little bit different than a lot of businesses in the way of really thinking about international early on. Uh, and thinking about that as just like a core piece of the the company. So over half of our business is international. We're in 170 countries, which is pretty exciting uh, and, and continues to see a lot of opportunity there. Uh, so it started in 2003. Let's, let's kind of like yeah. reverse engineer kind of, if you can get in the mindset back in those days. Um, yeah. What were you doing before you started the business? Where did the idea come from? What, what did that early maybe year or two look like? Yeah, so it started a little bit earlier in the way of like, uh, I was fortunate enough to get a computer uh, early on when I was like 12 or 13 years old and really uh, um, wasn't the coolest kid at the time, perhaps. So I was just trying to figure out like, what do I, what can I do? Like, I, I, I wanted to figure out like, how can I, how can I make money? How can I create some value out there? Was able to get into web design, start doing custom programming and whatnot. Ended up working at a dial-up internet company for a while and, and started trying to create a consulting revenue stream with that as well. Um, really liked the idea of building, really liked the idea of working with different businesses. Um, but also I knew that I wanted to go to fine art school, uh, which is a little bit of a, a odd direction perhaps given uh, what I was doing prior. And that's how I ended up in Chicago. Um, and uh, I started Active Campaign. I wish I had this like visionary moment and I knew like this is, this is what's going to occur. This is like my horizon of like what's going to happen. Um, in reality, I was just looking to pay for housing, food, uh, college itself, uh, and, and try to do that. And I knew that I wanted to approach it a little bit differently in the way of, I, I enjoyed consulting, I enjoyed working with a lot of different businesses, but I wanted to take something and continue to craft it. Uh, so I started with a uh, software that was contact management. As we had more customers, uh, I, I wanted to build out more of the customer experience, but I've always been very, uh, I had high expectations for what that meant. So we never really went out and actually bought or, or used services that existed. So when we needed a help desk, we built it. When we needed live chat, we built it. We built all these products in the first 10 years, we went from one to eight products, all encompassing the customer experience. And we were small, like we went from one to eight products, one to eight people. And so that means we had to automate a lot of things. Otherwise we wouldn't get anywhere. And we had, we had a ton of customers throughout the world. And so we started building automation within each and every tool set. And we're, we're finding success with that. It was, it was a really solid business, but it really exposed this opportunity that was kind of above the tool sets, above um, all the different individual areas of the customer experience. And, and what if we were to bring customer data together, unify that, and then center of customer experience entirely around automation. And that's that's really what Active Campaign is today. Uh, and, and that's been that fun journey that we've been on trying to continue to look, deliver upon that uh, ever since. So I'm, I'm trying to dip back to 2003 and how I was using the internet personally. It wasn't in a business setting yet at the time, but I, I got to imagine that the use cases of the need for contact management, um, not only for people, but businesses has kind of changed over time. Uh, maybe, maybe kind of take us back through that journey and maybe how you've either pivoted the business or, you know, customized products around that customer and what their needs were at the time as that evolution happened. Yeah, I think early on, it was thought of as very much of a campaign driven type of marketing for a uh, for business. Um, not, too that, not too far off from like going to a parking lot and putting flyers on cars. Um, this idea of like, just get a message 
um, to a bulk audience. Uh, that's never really resonated really well with me. So like we, we, we offered some of that, but it's always been this like idea of how do we take personalization and make that truly personal? Not, not like, hello, like first name, <clears throat> but like <laughs> actually personalized experiences, personalized content, timing, and give brands the idea. Like growing up, my, my parents always had small businesses and I would see that like passion, that drive. And like, and if you think of like a delightful experience you have with the brand, a lot of times that is with a very small business, one that's giving you that like personal sort of touch along the way. So how do you make that scalable? Uh, I, I'd say like back in 2003, that wasn't necessarily like the the demand, especially among like the SMB mid market. Um, but what we're seeing over time and like what we've been helping influence, I think as well as this, this rapid uh, maturing of, of the requirements of a small business. We look at this year, and now it's even more important than ever before for a business to be able to engage in a meaningful way, in a personalized way, not in a way where they're just like sending you tons of things or even just focused on messaging, but they're finding that like blend of messaging and human touch and like really figuring out like what is a customer experience that that would be optimal for the individual uh, prospect or customer. So, you know, there's a, I don't know, some flash to starting a tech company, I feel like nowadays. And, you know, there's this um, path that I think entrepreneurs are, you know, feel like they're destined to take, or that's the only route yeah. to take, which is like, come up with a good idea, get some funding, you're pitching all the time, you're re reading Fast Company and Inc. Magazine and hearing all these success stories and it's scale, scale, scale and grow, 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 grow. It, going back to the first 10 years of the business where, you know, you were, you were bootstrapping it and you were growing very thoughtfully um, and staying pretty lean, it sounds like as a team, okay. what was that a, a conscious decision? Was that like not even a thing back then? Like, you know, wh where did that decision-making come from around just, just the strategy of the business in terms of how, to, how having to scale it up or even if that was a thought or not? Yeah, there's definitely no flash. Like, uh, and I wasn't, I wasn't getting a lot of, of flashy attention, uh, to say the least, despite it, like, being a really solid business like during those first 10 years it was a it was a growing business it was profitable like it was a business like that more people should like uh, uh celebrate and, and get excited about and and for those in those businesses something to be super proud of right and so you know i think there were plenty of people taking the track that you're describing back then and probably even more so today um the reason why i did it was probably just primarily because i didn't have the opportunity or didn't seek the opportunity to do so. Um, and in part, I'm, I'm glad like that's, that's, that's allowed a lot of optionality. I think if we would have rushed early on and like how I described that 10 years, it took, it took us 10 years to get the thesis of what we're building today, right? And if I would have taken capital early on, I would have had to rush to my decision of what is my overall thesis. I would have probably been stuck in that same business model. It would have been harder to tr transition. Or if we did transition the business, I wouldn't have been able to do it in the way that we ended up doing it. Uh, meaning, uh, like we went from eight products into a single new offering, but for years we continued to support and help those customers that like helped grow Active Campaign historically. And that's like really important to me. Like it, the idea of being customer first as an organization, that's something that you no longer can just like put that on your side. You no longer can just like say that out loud and then go back to like just sunsetting all your products and treating your customers like crap. Like that will not work. The, the ability and transparency of customers understanding um, what the customer experience truly is at a brand uh, is very real now. I wanna, I wanna talk about that customer experience point uh, here, here in a minute, but just kind of stick into the the journey a little bit. Um, I don't know. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that that listen to this um, and are interested in you know insights and feedback from someone like yourself. But I don't know. Take take yourself back to I don't know. There there was a recession in those first ten years. Yeah. Um, you know what what were some like maybe tough uh, tough points along the way, adversity along the way, and how did you kind of tackle that? Um, ultimately, getting the success that you have today. Yeah, there, there were a couple things. I think early on, we started with truly small businesses. And then I think there's a lot of uh, talk. There's a lot of playbooks out there about moving up market, getting going after bigger deals. It feels easier. Um, and sometimes that's absolutely the right move. Um, but I think it actually opens up uh, some problems as well. 
And so like we started working with larger and larger um, licenses and, and opportunities. And to your point, 2008, it, it was an interesting time. Like we, uh, we went from being really profitable, doing well, to all of a sudden we were in a, a recession. Like it was a, it was a time where some of those big opportunities were not coming through. We ended up in some, some rough situations where we had to figure out like, how do we get through this? Uh, and from then I've, I've changed a lot of thinking in the way of, of how to build a business, the, uh, the dependency you have on large customers and avoiding that. Um, because we got into a situation where I, I just take on like a ton of personal credit card, but like it was, it, it got really weird, really fast. <laughs> and I took all that on personally and didn't let that get to the team at all. And I don't say that as like, uh, like I should get credit for that. It's actually the opposite. Like, I think I, looking back, if I would change something, I, I would be a little bit more transparent, not to the point of like, you know, scaring everyone or something like that, but, you know, tapping into thoughts people had of like, how do we get through a situation and whatnot? And so we use that time knowing like, I don't want to get back into the spot again. I also know if we go and try to do consulting or we try to do something to get through this time to gain revenue. It's something we'll have to do, mm. but I want to do it in a very intentional way where it won't necessarily force me to stay there. Meaning, so like to get through a tough time like then, uh, we we tap more into like custom programming, custom consulting, but ensured it didn't necessarily touch our product or like where we were looking to go entirely. And then on like nights and weekends, I'd be working on like odd projects. I did this project for a competitor in the space where I designed like hundreds of email templates and coded them all and whatnot for them. And it was like the most like demoralizing thing <laughs> working on, uh, like especially like late at night and whatnot. And, but like it helped us get through a, a period of time. Additionally, I think both back then and now, um, anytime you're in a situation where you feel like, you know, there, there's some risk, like you, you feel like, like there's something that's outside of your control, it's the perfect time to really focus in on your own customer experience. Meaning back then that meant like we, we tried to be available to our customers at nights. I would just have live chat open at all times. And like, uh, as long as I'm awake, if there's a ding, I'm going to talk to that customer. I uh, don't care what it is because I know like that's how we'll be able to continue through. That's how we'll be able to figure out like, what can we do next? Uh, going into this year uh, and early on this year, uh, obviously a little bit more built out and in a business that is is very sound at the same time, like knowing that we serve a lot of small businesses, I wanted to do whatever we could as fast mm -hmm. as we can to be there for our customers. So we basically looked at like the next six, 12 months of things we're thinking about doing in terms of our own customer experience and, and thought like, what are like, what of that, how much of that can we do like next week uh, and, and rally the team. And, and there's an understanding of change in a moment like that. Uh, where you can really focus in on your customer experience. And, and what we saw from there is like, uh, is a lot of these things that we're thinking about, a, a bunch of them has been helpful. And now that gives us the data to like further invest in that idea. Whereas before, like as you continue to scale, decisions start to sometimes take longer just because you start to get more conservative because of the downside, right? And so like trying to think through that, and I've, I've never had a time during the history of active campaign where we're doubling down on my own customer experience has been like a bad thing. Like that's like where I would go uh, in any moment like that. It's so interesting to hear you say that, especially now that the business is sound, it's, it's larger and, you know, going back to those times in 08, 09, and that there's a lot of founders that are struggling right now. And I've seen a lot yeah. of people react a few different ways to it. You know, you have the folks that like, like you mentioned in 08, 09, maybe internalized it you know, a little bit more and didn't seek help or, you know, tap, tap into that um, for their own benefit. I've also seen that on the employee side where it's like, are we good? Are we not good? I don't know. Like, should I be looking for a job now? You know, and then boom, layoffs happen. And then folks that are, you know, maybe a little bit too open and emotional and, and are freaking folks out um, with what's going on. When you internalized it though, um, how did that affect you day to day, either at work or at home, um, livelihood, mental health? Because yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's a good point. Tough. And I'd say in 08, I did not handle it well. And uh, the impact it had was probably more so personally than, than from a company standpoint. And in part, kind of like what you're getting up to a degree of like, 
as a founder, as an entrepreneur, as you're trying to run a business, you look at everyone else around you. And it's, it's this thing that constantly happens. It doesn't matter if times are good, bad. And that's a, that's a dangerous uh, game to play from a couple of standpoints. One, from a, your own mental health and whatnot, of just constantly doing those compares. It often comes from that competitiveness or whatnot that's in a lot of people. Um, but then also like, it can actually steer you in the wrong directions, right? Like, so like during times, especially where you're like, you're, you're looking like surely this competitor, this individual has it figured out, like, this is the path, let's go after that. So not only are you like, uh, like, I wish we were like that, but like, you're trying to model it. And then you start to lose some of your own, like, uh, genius that you might have within, or you lose mm. some of your own weakness. Uh, which will actually hurt you over time. Uh, but I think the other point um, that you were going at as well of just like finding like some people to talk to and whatnot, like uh, the thing of while I grew active campaign, I, I, I really kind of grew it in a bubble early on. Like I, I was just heads down building product, you know, building out the team, but never really went out into uh, the community at all in terms of talking to other people. And what I've really found over time is like, uh, one, people are more than willing to talk to, like, to people and like sharing and, and it really helps give you a, a sense of what you're going through. And oftentimes it's like changes and all these challenges and whatnot. It's like, it's not necessarily like super unique to yourself, right? And like the image that's shown brand wise from a lot of competitors and elsewhere is typically a different version of reality at times as well, right? So like it's, uh, it helps you hopefully then give yourself some credit to trust your own instincts and trust your own gut in terms of like what makes sense what is something that like let's not just like try to improve to be like another company well let's try to actually like build something uniquely it's so interesting to hear you say that i'm i'm just over two and a half years into my business. It's been a roller coaster. Never could have yeah. anticipated a pandemic. We're bouncing out of it now. I, I think I attribute a lot of how I think about things in long term and strategy and even what to do in the moment to advisors that I have or conversations that I have with like minded individuals that have done this before books that I read so on and so forth. I think the biggest thing for me that helps me really, really sleep at night, like I, I don't have a financial bone in my body, I understand like personal finance, I could put a spreadsheet together, like, okay, but I didn't really understand like, okay, like how much cash should I have in the bank at all times? If I make this investment, what happens? If I get a credit line, what happens? And then really when I've, when I've modeled that out, that like, if you don't have that map, it's really hard to execute what you want to because then you're just kind of emotionally like, hey, I think I'm good or I'm, I'm not good. And then, you know, something comes around the corner that you don't see. But, maybe speak to that a little bit. Like how, how did you, whether it's advisors or team members that you brought on or, or whoever it was helped you kind of shape the, okay, this is how you scale a company. This is how you grow. This is how other people are doing it. Maybe I can take a little bits and pieces and learn from this and create my own Frankenstein. Yeah. I think uh, the one area that I've really tried to focus in on is like building out the team in a, in a way that's uh, maybe less comfortable than, than, some would do. And what I mean by that is oftentimes people think about like building out a team and sort of uh, bringing in experience, expertise, whatever it may be, is like almost getting to this place of comfort for a, a founder or something. I think that's like opposite of what I think is actually beneficial, meaning I'm looking to build out a team of people that will actually have quite opposing views, like call it like more enterprise versus more SMB. Like I want to get that going on amongst the team as well as I'm looking for people that will push myself, right? Like that's the only way it'll be interesting. That's the only way it'll uh, continue to be able to innovate and grow. Um, so really kind of stretching that way as well. Uh, and, and that can be done a couple of different ways, but really results in something that's maybe less of that like uh, comfort, like don't have to worry about something as much and more of a, um, you're creating some level of um, maybe it's called control chaos or something around you yeah. that creates this energy of like really helping push on things throughout. And then that feels like it's less directly assistive to like myself perhaps, but it actually, it, it helps everyone, right? If you create a, a situation in a team like that. And then I think that kind of goes throughout the organization and can be a really powerful uh, way of building, building something innovative. We talked about this when we originally met. How, how do you continue just to stay motivated, amb ambition, 
growth. You know, it's it's not just like you and eight people and like make sure Jason and his family's okay. Like you have 700 people now. Um, you, you could have easily probably walked away from this thing and done something else at this point. What What is that carrot that's out there in front of you? Um, if you can even define it and how do you just kind of keep going year over year over year over year? You're 17 years going on 18 years into this thing. Yeah, no, it's it's uh it's been a while, so it's a good question. Like I I thoroughly just enjoy like what I do, right? And so like to unpack that, the reason why I enjoy it is like uh, the team throughout, um, like just pushing on all sorts of ideas. I always encourage uh, everyone that's just joining the company, and I, when I talk to like a new hire class or whatnot, of like use this moment to like push on ideas and like let's let's like come up with things early on. Don't wait on that. Um, because if we can create that culture of just continual sort of iteration and innovation, like that's exciting. Uh, couple that with the idea of like, we're really set out to help entrepreneurs and small businesses and up uh, transform their business. We're helping them save time. We're helping them grow. Uh, like during this time, we're helping them actually transform like the type of business they even are. That's really rewarding work in my mind. Like that's uh, so like a combination of the team and, and, the, and, and being able to help businesses go through something and the impact of all of that i'd say that's that's probably the biggest thing so it's more that than it's not like i've never thought of active campaign as like a like a quick like quick get this company built up to a certain point <laughs> basically on still some like hope someone like takes that and it's not our problem before it all falls over sure um, really building something that can be super long term sustainable and have a true impact on, on categories that we operate within but also just like businesses that are growing. I mentioned this, I, you know, I spent a corporate career 10 years at the same company. It started with two folks in a basement, 1983 and 35 years later, no money, no m and activity. It's 10,000 internal employees today. And what I learned from there, and I want to create something similar. And it seems like you have with active campaign. If you get uh, ambitious, like-minded individuals in terms of business um, on board and it's all about growing for the greater good of everybody else. Like those types of folks that are on the team are going to be looking for their next promotion opportunity at all times. And it's almost like, you know, you kind of made a shift there where now there's like a responsibility to like continue that growth for everybody else. And I, I feel that same pressure, even at a, a much smaller scale at Lucas James. But um, I, th I think it's great if, if you have ambitious people on the team um, that are looking for opportunities to change uh, themselves professionally and, and personally, you have to have a growing company that creates those yeah. opportunities for people. And I think there's also like, uh, there will be times as you grow a business where, um, whether it's yourself or people around you or the company itself or investors, like see something you want to go after. Maybe that's a playbook. Maybe that's like a move up market, but something that has some sort of return that maybe isn't in the direction entirely of what you describe of something certain long term. What I found beneficial with that is like setting like clear guidelines, uh, both internally and externally. So like we started uh, this idea of like no customer more than a half percent of our revenue, and that's a clear guideline. And and we you know it's it's fun until you test it, but like even when you test it, like it's fun after the fact of like what that can actually do to make sure that you're a main entrepreneur in up in our case, um, or in the case of our customers, like we have a bunch of customer success commitments and whatnot that we put on paper and hold ourselves to so that like we can't even deviate from it even if we got like into the mode of like well maybe we could just do this right now um find those couple of things you really want to uh focus in on and stay true to and, and just make sure that that you can hold yourself accountable and the team that's awesome that's awesome Let, let's switch to customer experience i, I want to make sure we have enough time for this because um I mentioned I talked to folks that are that have done this before, and I take little bits and pieces. The, the biggest thing that I took away from our conversation previously was the focus on customer experience. And you're a tech company, your parents were small business owners, I have a service business, and you're so spot on that, you know, I left that conversation basically saying like, okay, we, I need to get the leadership on the phone right now. We need to put ourselves in our customer shoes, reverse engineer that back and say, what do we want? What do we need? What do we not know that we need? that yeah. we want that we could be presented with. And it was it was such a good takeaway that I think gets lost in the shuffle all the time when it's like, we gotta go raise capital and we gotta grow and I'm getting a lot of pressure on, from finances and all this all this other stuff. Um, speak to that in terms of active campaign. How, how have you been able to create a, 
uh, a structure and a framework for your team as you've grown, probably a lot easier with eight people than 700 people. But I mean, you were so spot on with that and it's obviously shown up in the results. Yeah. And I think it's really ensuring that like how you measure success and how you can look at the business is wrapped up around that lens. And also understanding the areas that may not have a direct uh, relation to a monetary gain. And what I mean by that is like, uh, you could look at our business and, and, and we serve uh, from entrepreneurs and very small businesses and up. And a lot of our peers in the space would choose to move up market, right? Uh, as long as you're able to create a delightful experience, there's so much impact that can occur through advocacy and sort of a rippling effect of, of people that are having enjoyable experiences. So investing in it with some degree of, of hope and knowledge of like, you're actually getting a gain that's greater than just um, what you see on paper. So if you can make what you see on paper, something scalable and something you can uh, capital efficient, then you're in a really good spot. And using that more so for like brand, using that more so for a lot of things. I think uh, when people look at Active Campaign, we don't necessarily run a similar brand or marketing effort compared to a lot of B2B SaaS companies. Mm -hmm. And that's really like we're, we're focused beyond just North America in 170 countries, but also like we want to use our customers. We want to use their success, lead with them. And so like the more times so you, you can weave that into like how you operate, the easier it is for people uh, to really resonate and like get behind that. Uh, and then there's like just moments, like find the different areas. Like I, I email the company routinely and try to bring in uh, customer stories into that. Or when we have like a company update or in all hands, we always have either customers there or we walk through a scenario of like, this is this brand, but we're gonna spend a couple minutes like learning about it. And maybe it's like a boutique store in Australia or something like that. Learn about like how they started the store. Like what is their passion for that? how they find active campaign and like, what are the marketing pieces that impacted there? And then maybe they talk to sales and they talk to so-and-so there and then all of a sudden support. And you see how like the experience of this one brand that now you're able to actually relate to has touched pretty much all of the organization. And it's, it's awesome because like, as you go through that story, like some people's initial reaction is like, how are we possibly making this capital efficient? Because it's a lot of different touches for a small brand. But like the fact that we're able to and the fact like to understand the impact of the customer and like what they're going through and, and be able to understand their like tone, their value they're getting, um, the more you can do that, uh, like it's just such a powerful thing. Hey, like tactically, how does that show up Monday through Friday in a group? Is this like... Um, surveys of uh, processes when the customer success folks get up, get somebody on the phone. Is this like, Hey, I heard this from five customers. Like yeah. wh where is that? Like, okay. Information sure. happens. How are we, how are we grabbing it? Goes into the product test, test, test. Cause I mean that lather rinse repeat kind of model, especially over 17 years has got to, <laughs> got to make the product really great. Um, and, and how does that show up? Uh, with people. I think it's a combination of some of the group things like the company updates are all hands are good examples. Um, but also like just in the way of uh, like sharing feedback and making that a cultural thing. So like we have channels where people just share like feedback every single day that people are having and like stories you can kind of celebrate around and whatnot. Uh, additionally, we of course do like uh, NPS and different things like that. We have all sorts of different like data intakes on people's experiences that are being like brought in every single day. Now, what really matters there, both with that and voice of customer or anything else you could be doing is to not just summarize it. Meaning I don't care if like uh, a number changed in terms of a certain part of our platform in terms of uh, what people are thinking about it. That doesn't really help me that much. And it certainly doesn't motivate anyone working on the product because we don't know. So how do you get as much of that like raw text, raw tone to uh, the company to gain an understanding? So I'll, I'll read through most all of like the NPS and whatnot to just read, scan through it and just like, I'll have a better idea of the state of the company by doing that than any report someone can possibly generate. Like understanding that tone is so important. So how do you make that scalable? Uh, in part, it's like figuring out how do you take chunks of that? Because not everyone can consume 130,000 customers uh, feedback every single uh, day or month, um, but figure out like for a certain type of team or something like that, what is some of those feedback points? but to bring some of that raw text with it so that they can actually understand the tone as well. So it's just like anything we do, we're trying to think of like, how do we uh, add some customer component into it? Um, as well as when we're working on a project, we have very clear thoughts around like, what is success? It's, it's our customers using it. 
but it's also our customers using it in a way where it could possibly even create some sort of level of viral motion to it. Meaning they're finding such success or it's different or innovative enough where they want to like tell someone, even if that's just word of mouth of one other person mm. that's success. Is. I, I think if I'm like taking one, just it's a summer summary of a takeaway is you, you always have to make sure your product or service is good. Then like, what, what are you if you're not good at what you do and what you've dedicated your life to? And I think like, yeah, it gets lost in the shuffle sometimes with the day to day and what's going on and people stuff and customer stuff all the time. Um, but always going back to put yourself in the customer's shoes, reverse engineer that back and say, how could we show up better? How can we increase the product better? And I think, um, yeah, I think there's there's a lot of lot of folks that could that could use that advice right now. Uh, with the time we have left, you've been in Chicago um, uh, since you started the business, at least. Um, you've you've even mentioned during this podcast that hey, I didn't like really reach out that much into the community. I would I would say now Active Campaign is pretty well known. Um, you know, you're investing a lot of time and energy into supporting others um, in the community. How, how have you seen the ecosystem in Chicago grow, say, over the last five or 10 years? And, um, you know, what are your opinions on, you know, how can how can we become a tech powerhouse uh, nationally? Yeah, no, I think it's, uh, it's it's been fun to be part of the ecosystem today and uh, like it's and watch it as well. I, I, I do wish like, one of the things I would have changed earlier on would be becoming more involved and in, 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 like just talking with more people earlier on because I think it would have been a benefit and, and save me some time on some decisions to say the least. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think it's this, uh, it, it's something that's just continuing to grow. And, and I, I just love uh, sort of the, the talent base that exists and this thought on innovation. I think there's a lot of um, real desire for building long-term businesses, uh, which I think is not exclusively unique to the Chicagoland area, but like uh, it really resonates really well. Uh, so I, I, I love that aspect as well. I would say... Um, I don't know. I think there's so much good occurring and there's so many businesses doing well at this time and business transitioning and finding their way through as well. But um, focusing on like there's success in that, like we don't need necessarily like the one big outlier to define our city. Right. Um, I, I, I find like the, the multitude of, of businesses um, including businesses that don't have like, uh, that aren't getting news or press for like employee counters, but they're like amazing businesses that if you put them against a lot of businesses that could press are probably even better um, credits. So there's a lot of good and I just see that continuing to build. And I just hope that like that good that kind of exists in that and that long-term nature continues. So that's pretty exciting. When you look at uh, really any city, it's really driven by the industry that's there. Right. And, you know, there's been an increase in technology companies and historically it's been food or manufacturing or logistics yeah. We're right in the center of the, in the nation. And now we have this, whether it's P33 or just a collective group of individuals that are really trying to drive the city forward in that I, I see a huge benefit. I'm not going anywhere. Got family here. I got my roots here. And especially being in the talent space, um, we need tech companies um, more and more and more and growing, 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 because that creates jobs that draws talent. And then those salaries trickle into restaurants and those salaries trickle into other things. And, you know, that's, that's what, how a city thrives. And I hate, um, you know, I went to Detroit back in 2010 and Detroit's thriving now comparatively to then, but I remember walking through a ghost town and I'm like, how the hell does this happen? Not that the, I think that's a risk for us, but when we talk about the Chicago tech ecosystem, I think it's it's more than just, you know, flash or yeah, just the the one big hitter that yeah. defined the the ecosystem. Like this is people's livelihoods and um, you know, technology is the wave of the future. And I think we're right at the heart of it. But um yeah, absolutely. Well, hey Jason, thank you so much for taking the time, man. This is this is really great. I know you're busy just kind of closing the year. Um any last thoughts or uh, if people are interested in active campaign or they would like to follow some of the stuff that you put out, where can they find you? Yeah, uh, activecampaign.com. You can reach out at Jason at Active Campaign. And really, the last thought that I always sort of kind of have is like along that journey and like when there's self doubt and whatnot, trusting your own instinct, trusting your own gut, and like not necessarily doing the compare against everyone else is is such a powerful and freeing thing that uh, uh, more people should tap into. But. I love it. Thanks so much, Jason. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>